So the nuclear genome is located inside the algae nucleus. And in this case, I'm going to be specifically be talking about Chlamydomonas reinhardi, which is the organism that we use in our lab, but this knowledge is translatable to any other green algae. So the nuclear genome is roughly 120 million base pairs, and just so you have an idea how big that is, uh, the typical bacterial genome is about 3 to 6 million base pairs, and the human one is about 3,000 million base pairs. So it's somehow in between. And even though we have other genomes inside the cell, so we have one genome inside the mitochondria and we have another genome inside the chloroplast, the nuclear genome comprises over 99% of genes in the algae. So if you want to change something like the metabolism, you definitely need to change the genome inside the nucleus. This genome is haploid. It means that it's present in only a single copy as opposed to other organisms like humans. So for example, in humans, we have uh, our genome copied uh, two times called diploid. So you would need to change, uh, if you change the genome, you need to change it in both copies to look the same. And we don't have to do that because it's haploid. Another characteristic is that it's transformable, which means that we can change it. We can add or subtract genes as we wish. So that's very useful for us and thus the genetic engineering. So one very important concept is that when you can engineer uh, a gene inside the, uh, the clammy, you need to prepare that structure to look as best as possible. So. There are two big, uh, big important parts in the gene structure. So one, it's the regulatory sequence, and that, those are the sequences that are going to determine how strongly and how often is your gene going to be activated. And the other part is the coding sequence, which is going to determine the amino acid sequence. So the genome, uh, the gene, it's uh, a DNA sequence. And then that DNA sequence has one very important part in terms of regulatory sequence, which is the promoter. So the promoter is going to determine how strong your gene is going to be translated into mRNA, which is a copy that is made of the DNA, and how often that happens. Now, when you have that mRNA, it has two other regulatory sequences, which, has, which are the 5' prime UTR and the 3' prime UTR, which stands for untranslated region. Those two parts are going to determine how stable is that molecule and also how often it becomes translated into protein by the ribosome. So, now you have to choose your best uh, regulatory sequences, which are the promoters and the three, three prime and five prime UTRs. But additionally, you also have to choose the best uh, coding sequence. And this coding sequence will uh, depend on what is your final amino acid sequence. So most likely you will just be mimicking a naturally occurring protein, like for example, a human antibody or insulin. So you already have a amino acid sequence of interest. However, sometimes you may want to change a couple of amino acids to enhance its function, make it stronger, or you may just want to fuse it to another protein to give it an additional function. So you can also do that. Now, after you've done that, you come out with a final amino acid sequence. And this amino acid sequence now needs to be made into a DNA sequence because the gene is made of DNA. So you do that by using the codon table, which you can see in the screen. So the codon table basically it's telling you that each amino acid is uniquely coded by three different letters. So when the ribosome is reading the mRNA, it's reading the bases, the, the letters that we call them, uh, in groups of three. And every single group of three will uniquely code for amino acid. But since there are many more combinations of codons that there are of amino acids, the single one amino acid can be coded by more than one uh, codon. So as you can see in the bottom left part of the of the this graph, you can see valine is coded by four different codons. But all the organisms don't use this codon randomly. So you don't happen to find those in the genome 25% of the time you see a baleen. Maybe the first one, it shows up every 90% of the time. The second one shows up 8% of the time, and the other two ones, you barely see them. So when you make your sequence, you want to make sure that you're using the most frequent codon in the, that is coding for that amino acid. So the cell uh, has an easier time producing your protein. If you don't do that, you might find bottlenecks, and it might become a little bit troublesome for the cell. So you need to optimize that, and that's called codon optimization. Okay, so now you've designed your gene, but there's one additional part to this. Uh, one key concept is that, for example, if you are going to change the metabolism, something called metabolic engineering, you need to understand that each reaction happens in a specific part of the cell. So for example, if you want to change your cells and make them more efficient at photosynthesis, you most likely will be targeting the photosynthesis pathway, and that happens in the chloroplast. You need to target your protein to the chloroplast. If you want to change the Krebs cycle, you need your proteins to be in the cytosol. If you need to change gene expression, you need to target your proteins to the nucleus, and so on and so forth. So this technology is actually available for us, and we do it through something called protein tags. So protein tags are small protein sequences, typically something like four amino acids up to like 20. 
and they can be added to either side of the proteins. They can be added to the N terminus or they can be added to the C terminus. And those uh, allows us to target the proteins to different cell compartments. And we actually went ahead and did that. So you can see an example here of GSP of our, as our proteins of interest. And we have a chloroplast transit sequence. We have a mitochondrial transit sequence and nuclear localization sequence and ER transit sequence and an ER transit sequence with an additional HDL. So what that means is, for example, in the first case, a CTS will target our protein to the chloroplast, and NTS will do that for the, new, for the, for the mitochondria. Uh, another uh, and special example of this is the ER transcription uh, signal will target our protein to the ER, but then if you don't do anything else, this protein will follow its secretory pathway and will secrete it to the extracellular medium, which is something very important for us. But if you want this protein to stay in the ER, you need to add this HDL extra sequence. And as you can, you can see in these uh, fluorescent pictures, in the top, four, uh, the top four pictures, in the top row, you can see that we did that for the nucleus, and you can see the fluorescent protein was targeted inside the nucleus uniquely. We did it for the mitochondria, we did it for the chloroplast, and we did it for the ER. So it's something it's available for us to do. So I also mentioned that you can secrete your proteins, and that is very important, because the way that these proteins are being secreted is first you have the mRNA being transcribed inside the nucleus. This mRNA goes to the cytosol, where the ribosome is going to read it and it's going to make a protein. That protein will be translocated inside the ER. And from here, it will travel to the Golgi through vesicles. And then through the Golgi, it will be secreted to the extracellular medium through vesicles again. Now, while this protein is traveling through the ER and the Golgi, it will be modified. And one of the most important modifications is glycosylation. Now, glycosylation, glycosylation is nothing other than the addition of specific sugars in a specific pattern to certain parts of the protein that are known. So by doing this, the proteins acquire their final biological functions. So if this glycosylation is not properly made, maybe the protein won't function like you want it to, or some other times it will just make the protein to be more stable, more resistant to degradation. So you'll have a product that will last longer. So it's a better product as well, and it's very important for us to have it. So this protein secretion is very important for us, and I'll show you why. So this technology can be applied to solving real life problems. So for example, let's say you want to produce insulin and you want to secrete it. Why is that important? So we do that with algae in our lab and we do it in a bioreactor, as you can see in this picture. And a bioreactor is nothing else than a cell culture vessel in which you have your cells growing in very highly optimized situations so you can reach the higher densities and the higher uses that you can. That's very important for us because generally speaking, a higher final biomass will translate into a higher final product yield. So what's important that we're secreting our proteins? Well, one thing that you need to understand is that most of the proteins are inside the green algae. Now, only a few subset of them are being secreted. So if you secrete your protein of interest to the media, but all the others are remaining inside the cell, when you finish growing your cells, you can just take the cell culture, you can centrifuge it, which is a very simple technique, and by doing that, you will just have separated your protein of interest for most of all the other proteins. Now, just by doing that, you already have purified, uh, you already obtain a pretty purified product, which is the cell supernatant. And by doing that, we can make different products, and it's something very important for us. Okay, so finally, uh, future opportunities and challenges. So, in order for this technology to finally be competitive to go that extra step that we needed to go, we need to develop more powerful and precise genetic tools, and that means we need to improve our capacity to precisely target our genes inside the genome, to have them land exactly where we want to, and to be able to subtract exactly the, genome, the genes that we are not interested in having inside the cell, and that's called targeted gene integration. As well, we also need to improve our genetic tools to have fine-tuned recombinant gene expression, which means that we need to be able to fully control our genes that we're introducing and be able to express them exactly when we want and shut them down exactly when we don't want them to be expressed. Finally, we also need to improve and implement high yield cultivation techniques in bioreactors because any improvement in biomass that you can get in a bioreactor will directly translate in an improvement of your protein that you're making through genetic engineering in the nucleus. And last but not least, characterize more algae species because that's very important for us. There is a huge biodiversity out there in terms of algae, and the more we know about that, the more potential products that we can identify, and these potential products will drive the interest in research, so we will get more, uh, more people interested in developing precise, precise genetic tools and improving uh, the bioreactor geos. And that's all. Uh, thank you very much for watching.